happen synchronously, as if they shared a single body or a phantom abuser. Coincidence might have been plausible until Lark left the slight world and the unexplained bruises continued raising their greens and purple blacks eventlessly upon her. It had been six years since she'd left, six years of minor aches and injuries not her own to tend. And now pregnant. Lark's breasts hurt, but she wasn't. Couldn't be. Stitched, zipped up as she was. Nipples raw against t-shirts, sheets. With Nene this, yes, but else? A kind of calmly, although she moved it moved through it more like numbly, as during mending. Bones knitting. Her pregnant had been a broken state, and the child was a fix, a knot inside the wound. Nothing won, and when she gave birth, it was just another rent, another bit she wasn't getting back. The right mother would have made good, simple words at the in-fluttering thing. Fly. Go. Be. You. The right mother could give and feel all sorts of right things she was incapable of. Whole joy. Resale valued joy. That store didn't like her. It was Clef who was pregnant. Had to be. But to live this again, adjacently for her sister's body? How could that be fair? And how could she be thinking fair? Whose word was that? Lark's dream woke her. Her, swimming in borscht. Drew? she asked. Yes, Drew was now awake also. I think I have to get out of here. Drew's body nodded toward her, his eyes closed. Was the ocean bullion? No, borscht. Yes, that's no good. On the flight to New York, Clef had the aisle. I mean, I'm sorry. On the flight to New York to Clef, Lark had the aisle. The young girl beside her was maybe in high school, maybe not yet. She smelled like powder. Something about her assured Lark she'd never taken. She was lovely in a really human way. She wasn't, for example, aware of Lark staring at her. She didn't, because of the staring, extend her limbs against the short seat so her thighs wouldn't thicken. She slouched but didn't slouch with length. What's your name? Lark asked. Anna? Lark smiled. It was a lovely human name. Lark's parents had named their first daughter out of, after a type of bird or adventure, an adventure light, one that flew or flew by. Lark was supposed to grow into her name, to gather it round herself like an Easter shawl to keep herself, her safe from every weighty thing. Forget that shawls don't protect against the elements, that only widows pin tight the neck or whores with gaudier jewelry. Forget that children kite them overhead in wind, that little girls taunt imaginary bulls with dirt-swept shawls, torn. To her mother and father, Lark's name was like an aria. They forgot that it rhymed with dark. Lark had tried at lovely, at light, to disappear, by herself with ten or eleven other girls daily for over a decade. The room she grew up in, was the exact shape of a shoebox. On one side of the slight chamber, chamber, a string of windows allowed her to look down on the suburban development where she'd never played, but watched others play. The opposing wall was mirrors. Every childhood evening, after school, before home, Lark had attempted slight between sunsets. One might think this would promote an auspicious sense of beauty. Lark spent all her youth, penny by shiny penny, measuring herself against beauty and its mimic. Herself she found wanting. Lark looked at the girl again. Anna was now sleeping and sleeping younger, capable of pluck, of damage by fingertip. Out the window of the plane beyond her it was late afternoon. By age twelve, Lark had acquired all of the normal self-hatreds. She became a meticulously ordered catalogue of ugliness, repulsive to herself. Lark was uncertain now how repulsive she'd been to others, but a torturer cannot concern herself with the guilt or innocence of her captive. She'd had acne. 
It was mild as acne goes, but ever-present. It had haunted her cheekbones and hairline, cropped up beneath her jaw and around her nose. Nights in front of the mirrors that seemed to be everywhere. Slight chamber, locker room, her purse at home in the bathrooms, bedrooms, hallways, and dining room wall. Lark had picked at her face until it oozed or bled, then splashed rubbing alcohol on the wounds and cried. Really, the pain was unworth, unworthy of tears. They'd simply attached themselves, recognizing the uncanny way they completed the evening ritual. If she didn't shed a few each night, she'd been certain she'd wake the next day welted, leprous. She never did test the hypothesis. Te tears were too easily produced to forego. Anna coughed. Lark reached over to cover her torso with one of the blue blankets. The orange in the sky was now orange in Anna's hair, and for a few seconds she looked like a softer, more manageable clef. Her sister Clef had always had a wildly red mane. Lark should have been too old to envy. Lark's hair was boy short now, but she'd worn it long and silky black in high school. To keep it from separating into clumps, Lark had brushed it constantly and washed it with hard soap twice daily, which made the roots brittle, which meant when she pulled it back for slight, the hair around her face broke and small quarter-inch shafts spiked outward in an unintentional nod to punk rock. <laughs> Lark had wanted to be Catherine Deneuve. She was nothing like her, and it had made her furious. She trembled all the time. Lark snuck another look at Anna sleeping. Anna folded in, and because she was aware of herself as mother, herself as failed sister, Lark decided the, the girl was still cold. Is this how it will be for my daughter? Thingness? Dolldom? Too many of the worst possible years spent being leered at or worried over. Lark shivered. She rarely considered her daughter in the future tense. It seemed self-indulgent. Nene was so unlike her mother. Nene, despite everything else, had honest limbs. As a child, Lark had hidden her potential among her tendons. Specifically, her knees and elbows, always poised slightly bent, were prepared to let Raph exit through a swift extension of, of forearm and fist, of shin and foot. She remembered living in that position for years, never exercising her anger, except during certain of the fastest slight manipulations, or in bed. The wall beside Lark's bed was battered by sleeping. To a social worker, she mused, the room, now Nene's, would have looked very much like the scene of abuse. The pilot announced the landing. The ground was moving close. Lark's ears were blocked. Anna woke up, and noticing Lark awkwardly opening and shutting her mouth, stretched and smiled her barely developed embarrassment. It was too sweet. How unreal the girl was. How actual. Lark had expected something different from life, something extraordinary, public. That's why she'd gone to the academy, and she'd been good, very. But slightest aren't known by name. Their greatest feat is an out of sight, a wicking. The most talented, talented of them hardly visible during a performance. She was never a true slightest. But once she quit, Lark didn't seek out notoriety. People who want fame are willing to make other sacrifices of a different kind. Lark had only ever slaughtered a few needs to make her souls. This last soul, she thought, peering into the indigo whirls of her blue fingertips, made eleven. Anna walked behind Lark into the terminal. Lark held herself impeccably. She occasionally turned her head so that Anna could just see the left side of her face, the high cheekbone. It was a good angle. In the middle of the final series, first Sephiro, Fortress, Sacrifly, Infold, Pearl, second Sephiro, J Ladder, Clef felt the alien tug. The thing was too small to make noise. 
but she'd read yesterday that her body would start immediately converting itself into a house. The tendons would start the real line without say-so for this first crocus. She'd spent her entire life mastering her entire life, which lived bodily, continually bending the bodily toward what was not, ad absentia. She knew her torso. She knew the seven exercises it took to get the abdominals and the latissimi dorsi warm quickly, how quickly she could drop a lateral lower to her left than right by 2.6 inches, how the empty space felt concave between hip bones when she extended full length in hotel beds after slight, too tired to eat because of bad dreams. And she, now she was supposed to end this knowing because kitchen's condom broke. She was supposed to give up her body for 18 months, nine flitting up to light, nine in burnt drift down. And kitchen didn't want it and said so. Nor did she. Did she?